When looking for the king of podcasts, you're at the wrong channel. If looking for great ideas for life, you're far from good hands. If you're a person who thinks the listener is always and completely right, we find ways to prove you wrong. Hosted by a Northeasterner by birth, you're a rebel by choice. If you want to host that folks between love and madness and finger licking entertainment, then play on and listen to the crock and crazy train with you. What up, Crazy Train Radio? Hello. 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 God bless the internet. Woo! That's the fact, Jack! Nothing is over! What? Woo! Am I on the internet? He called the shit poop! Oh my god, who the hell cares? Right on, sweet sister! You ain't cool unless you pee your pants! Oh, jerka jerka jerka. Laura Park Lincoln, coming up on Crazy Train Radio. Well, folks, I think the guy I'm going to banner with again is the biggest reason tonight's guest was on QVC as a celebrity host. I only say that because I think he bought a record number of Freedom Bags, which was one of the items he was Selling. King of R. How you doing, sir? Very well. How are you doing tonight, Rock? Good. And the question would be, what have you done with your freedom bags that you bought off QVC all those years ago? Well, <clears throat> what can't you do with a freedom bag? I mean, there's just so much that you can do with it. So I've used it many, many times. Of course, when I go camping, when I go out for trips, you know, it comes in so handy, and that's why I bought so many of them as I did on QVC all those years ago. Well, obviously, we're talking about Laura Park Lincoln, and obviously, you do Talk and Terror Presents, which we've talked about before, and it's the obvious question. Would Friday be the first experience you've had with Laura? Uh, no, actually. I will play the reverse. My first uh, experience with Laura Park Lincoln was with Freddy's Nightmares. Uh, an episode that she had did, which is my favorite episode of Freddy's Nightmares. You could actually probably find it uh, on YouTube or wherever else you could find those uh, recordings. But it was a fantastic little episode about a fast food joint, and she plays a girlfriend that gets shot by a robber. And it was so surreal and weird, and it had Freddy kind of bookending these uh, segments. So I saw that first on NBC when it premiered way back in the day. And then I eventually saw Friday uh, 7, uh, which I think is one of the best entries in the series. And you would probably be able to answer this better than me off the top of my head, because uh, for some reason, maybe the couple shots of uh, alcohol have something to do with this. <laughs> but that's our crock. <laughs> well, you know, what? Well, hey, I learned from you, you know. That's right, yeah. Yeah, even though you drink that pussy uh, patch beer, that's a whole other story. But the that's question true. is, <laughs> yes, it is. I've, I've seen them do this, folks. I have, but, yeah. Uh, it's, it didn't happen. And this is why they, and this is why the intro fits that you just recorded for a new <laughs> yeah. intro. Uh, I'll get it aside though. Isn't she one of only, if not at least one of a few, that has been involved with the Nightmare series somehow, whether it's one of the movies or Freddy's Nightmares and the Friday the Thirteenth series? Yeah, she is actually the only star uh, to ever appear opposite Jason, and be in a Freddy-themed TV show. Even though Freddy wasn't in the episode that she was actually in, uh, it's still a crossover uh, series. So, yeah, technically she has been in both Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday 13th, one of the first and only. Yes, I, I'm trying to think if who the other one would be, <clears throat> if I can remember. Do you know who the other would be, by chance? That was in both? Yeah, uh, that had some sort of connection to both. 
Not off the top of my head, no. I did, that's why I said I kind of questioned that. Because I don't think there was another starlet that was in Freddy's Nightmares that was in Friday 13th. I think they kept them separate. Um, the Noir Parks episode was not a Freddy episode. They did those episodes of Freddy during sweeps, but she wasn't an episode that didn't feature Freddy. So I guess that was kind of, in a way, a good thing. Yeah, and I think that particular episode that you bring up was actually involved in a uh, DVD. It might be in a Nightmare 1 re-release, I guess, for Blu-ray and all that fun jazz, because you know how often they release that stuff, or re-release that stuff, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember uh, it being a very, very creepy episode. It was, it was a very good one. Like I said, you can probably find it on YouTube for free, but I just remember being really creeped out by it when I was a kid, so it stuck with me. Well... Favorite Laura moment that you've seen, whether it's Friday, the Nightmares, you know, obviously she's done QVC, Knots Landing, a uh, mixture of things, but favorite yeah. moment for you? Um, I mean, that's, like I said, she's been in it so much, and, you know, obviously horror movies aside, my favorite movie, uh, moment, rather, is always going to be when she drowns Jason Voorhees in a puddle of mud at uh, towards the end of Friday 13th, Part 7. She was the first girl to really kick his ass, you know, using telekinesis power that we had never seen before. She wasn't afraid to use it by the end of that movie. So it was it was impressive. Well, for sure. And I, she addresses it in the interview, my last question for you. But okay. do you think that they will do a remake to maybe show t- or continuation or something along the lines to show Tina as one of the survivors, uh, as a full-grown adult, maybe? Um, you know, honestly, I would love to see that. And I know there was a rumor going around back in the early 2000s that they were going to do a Survivors-type film that featured the survivors of Friday the 13th and how they go back and deal with their issues. And Law Park Lincoln was supposed to be featured in that. Uh, it never came to fruition uh, due to issues with Paramount and New Line and, and uh, what they were going through. But I would love to see Water Park Lincoln return to Camp Crystal Lake and take on Jason one more time. There was no better match than that, in my opinion, watching Part 7 again recently and seeing Water Park Lincoln really just do damage to Jason. Well, you know, that actually leads to one other follow-up question in my two or three uh, brain cells that are working that I consider a brain. Firing yeah, all I know. Just... <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you say uh, the survivors kind of addressing their issues again, uh, would you say that that's fallen along the lines of, say, what you would see in Saw 3D, that type of deal? Uh, in a way, yes, I think so. I think, um, you know, it's, it's the thing that you don't really get to see very often with slasher films, is especially in continuation films. You never really get to see the survivors deal with what happened to them. You don't really get to see them trying to recuperate their lives. I mean, you get it in Halloween H2O with Jamie Lee Curtis. You get it a little bit in Friday the 13th Part 2 with Alice. But you don't really ever get uh, survivors going back to where it happened and kind of dealing with the situation. And that's where I kind of felt like a Lark Park Lincoln film where she goes back to Ken Crystal Lake, fully knowing where her powers are. You know, it would be an impressive movie. And especially with the technology we have these days, they could do a lot with, with their money. Well, that's true, but, and you know, I keep saying it, but I'm actually thinking of a fan question that she kind of addressed, but I'll throw it to you to wrap this up. Sure. Somebody, yeah, somebody had asked, fan-wise anyway, about her uh, using the, tel- well, let me rephrase this. How do I put this? That, you know, if she supposedly grew up, up on Camp Crystal Lake, or not so much grew up there, but had the vacation home there. Hmm. How come she never knew of the legend of Jason? Well, that's actually a great question, Croc. Um, this is something that I've discussed on the show, uh, that I do Talking Terror Presents, and as well in real life. The Friday the 13th, the universe kind of exists in its own little world, where nobody really knows what's going on. You know, it's very selective. You you feel like the adults kind of know what's going on, and they know what really the deal is with Jason and the murders and Mrs. Voorhees, but the teenagers don't. perfect example is Friday the 13th Part 4. You have the big lake, everything that just happened in Friday the 13th Part 3. But when Friday the 13th Part 4 kicks off, you have Tommy's mom and his sister 
doing laps around the lake like nothing happened. You would think a cop might come to the door and say, hey, by the way, a bunch of teenagers got butchered uh, the night before. We want to make sure you're okay. But, no, they don't do that. They just kind of make it seem like, well, they're no worse for the wear. But there's always that little hint in the background of every Friday 13th movie that there's somebody that knows something more that's going on. And usually it's the adults. And then they change the camp name in Friday 13th Part 6, you know, thinking that it's going to get rid of the whole thing. You know, it's always been ignorance is bliss when it comes to Camp Crystal Lake and Jason Voorhees. So, yeah, they very easily could live there and never heard about Jason. Because, hmm. you know, that's – and I think they addressed that a little bit, and I know we're getting off topic, but we'll shoot to the interview after this. They kind of addressed that in Freddy vs. Jason, I think, where they tried to erase the dreams of Freddy and the ignorance is bliss, as you put it. Hmm. Would you agree with that? I, I think I will, but then again, Freddy, uh, Freddy versus Jason is a huge issue with me, too, because Jason, to me, is a Jersey guy. He lives in New Jersey. He kills in New Jersey. That's where he's from. Freddy Krueger is in Springwood, Ohio, but in Freddy versus Jason, they drive to New Jersey like it's an hour away. You know, we're going to bring him back to the camp, but we're going to revive him, and they're going to have their battle. Well, it's going to take you a lot of, a long time to drive from Ohio to New Jersey. I've done that trip. It's going to take you a couple hours at best. And that's if you're speeding. So, yeah, ignorance is bliss when it comes uh, to slasher movies. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah, that's true. Well, what the fuck? Let's go to the interview. Oh, hell yeah. Let's do it. known as America's Audition Coach, as we were just talking off air. But she's done a couple projects. You know, they were somewhat known, you know, just a little bit. Not Landing, you know, she's done Freddy's Nightmares, the TV show, Murder, She Wrote, a little film called Friday the 13th, Part 7. Uh, Laura Park Lincoln, how are you? I am terrific and so thrilled to get to do this interview with you this morning. Yeah, we, you know, and people who follow us on Facebook and follow you and all that other song and jazz would know, I recently on Facebook at least had told the story. Well, that's a whole other thing to get into, but I told, we, this has been in the works for 18 months or so when you and me had first uh, met, I guess, yeah, probably about 18 months ago at Bazaar 2 in Atlantic City. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so long story That's short, right. you know, yeah, long story short, you know, time, schedules didn't work out, we're both busy people, you know, we got families, work, all, you know, all the all the usual stuff. However, you know, it's finally happened. How did you put it when you uh, first called me? I have, how did I what? Something, something, how did you put it, something along like this? Uh, when I said it was all credit to you, but you said it was everybody working together, how did you put oh. that? Oh, no, I, I, I just said, I, I think I just said we're, we're all in this uh, temporary, I don't know what I said, something about we're all just kind of in this temporary place called Earth together or something like that. I don't know yeah. what I said. She made it sound good, though, you know. I, <laughs> she made it sound good, I, I'll put it that way, you know. But, uh, well, first and foremost, because I'll bring it up and you can take it as far as you want. Obviously, I know a little more because of us going back and forth with text and everything else. Yeah. But, you know, how is your health overall right now? Because right now we know you're a breast cancer survivor. Yeah, I am doing super fantastic. I'm really doing fantastic and it has been a really, really long road. I was diagnosed in late '08. And uh, we are now in 2015, <laughs> and um, I finished surgery number 16 the end of uh, the end of la- uh, last year, 2014, uh, due to I was stage three breast cancer, and uh, due to a malpractice issue, uh, ended up uh, instead of getting through treatments and not dying in 18 months, it ended up taking a little over six years to to try to stay alive. So. 
it, it's been a really long, complicated process. Not not a, not a really unlike other people that deal with a serious health issue. Mine was just complicated by um, the lack of losing health insurance in the middle of it and dealing with a, a doctor that, that did malpractice. So I'm yeah, I'm laughing that's... on this end. Let me tell you. Yeah, and it's you know, yeah, it's inter- it's an interesting road. People who know me on the personal side, Laura knows the story as well. Don't have to get into it. But, you know, um, I know that road and journey, too, with two of myself. And right. today's actually the anniversary. Laura was giving me a nice kick in the ass on Wednesday, or Monday and Tuesday, since we're taping us <laughs> on a Wednesday. But it was in a good way, you know, as only she can yeah. put it. But uh, Well... You know, I, I'm I'm known for kind of kicking people in the ass. I guess I, I guess that's what I'm known for, motivating uh, with the the hard the hard school of tough love. But you know, we all make our we all have to make a choice every day for that day. And the people that are around me and know me see me generally as extremely positive, highly motivated, and very energetic. And but you know it's it's not obviously that way all the time. And when I have the days where it doesn't work, that I I crawl into what I call my little nest. You know, the poodles are with me. The nest, the food, the TV, the books, the magazines, and some chocolate. And and I get through the day. And um, but that's that's not often. Most of the time, when I wake up, I have to make a choice. Like millions and millions of other people, I have to make a choice to make the day work because. You know, I don't like morning. I, I don't wake up like a happy person. I get better at, at hours and my tea and things start working. But, uh, you know, we make a choice on everything that we do. And I was I was speaking to a, a women's, not really just women, there were men in the room, but mostly a women's group. And um, I was just explaining how, you know, we all audition for something every day, whether or not it's, and whether or not you're an actress or you're a business person or you're, a student, no matter what you are, we're all auditioning all of the time, and actors have to learn to make make really strong choices. And as, and a, as an actress, you know you you can't um, you can't look bad when you have the flu because there's no one to replace you. So you can have 104 and be dying and ill and whatever and broken bones, but you still have to look fantastic to make that show work because of all the people involved. And I guess I kind of take that same theory into my own life where. You know, I, I make a decision, okay, this is a happy morning or this is going to be a positive, and then I, I just remind myself of it during the day. And that's how I pretty much make it through, honestly. Make and it's work. funny because I was talk, talking to another show host that we uh, that I'm uh, close with, and they've been good people as well in the couple years I've been doing this. And he was asking me about you, uh, the guys over at Talking Terror Presents. I said, let uh-huh. me be honest with you. And I didn't think – anything of it, and I know we're getting off topic here, but who cares? I call the shots. That's uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, they said, hey, uh, yeah, what's, so what's Lord like? You know, I said, honestly, yeah, it's everything you said, mostly positive, and yeah, we all have our good days and bad days. However, you know, that she... At first, it was just trying to get an interview with you at the time, but now it is, <laughs> I think it's blossomed into a pretty cool friendship. And it's, yeah, absolutely. You're, you're real. That. You're real, which is awesome. So she is probably the most fun you'd want to have her on, and the best stories about her can't be told. I'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny, but but you know, I, I, honest honestly, I have to say, I, I wish I were as, as complicated as, as some people think. But but really, you know, You're I, not. I do. I, well, I do my own email and all that stuff, and so it's kind of like literally, you know, I get so many hundreds of them a day between the, the acting studio and just regular people and then fans and whatnot. And, um, you know, sometimes there's an assistant and whatnot, yeah. Sometimes there's an assistant or someone that helps. But I, I really do pretty much manage it alone, uh, which is probably what gave me cancer, but uh, that's another story. But uh, it, it, it's really um, who's at the top of that email list, how many I can read in a day and then figure out where I filed them. So if someone really has to reach me, they need to do it quite a few times in a row to keep moving up the email list. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I need better computer classes to learn how to manage that better. So, uh, or a but, uh, computer class. But, nice. But last uh, cancer question for you. And people right. look at this the wrong way, whatever. 
I'll pretty much say go to hell because, you know, everybody faces it, whether it's in your life and all health-wise. Right. Was it something right. that you noticed personally, like something up, or was it during a normal, you know, annual physical that say, they said, hey, they told you, hey, uh, oh, something's up here? Yeah, for oh, yours. Oh, my gosh. Uh, oh, my goodness. Well, I had had a biopsy at one point and was told it was negative. And actually, it was it, it was a horror story in itself because I was on my way to shoot a film called Into the Dark or From the Dark. And uh, I think it's like out on DVD or something. And I was really just the opening kind of a, um, a cameo appearance for it, you know. And it was, a, of course, it was, you know, a night shoot, which is what they are. And... Uh, I had to, I just woke up one morning and I said I it was strange it was a strange feeling I, I said I've got to go get that mammogram now and I don't even know how I got in to tell you the truth I went to do the mammogram and um, the doctor needed they they usually tell you to come right back so I went I went back that afternoon to do a biopsy and I'm like okay doctor I know I don't know you but I've already memorized my lines for tonight and I search I go to the set at ten and. So you can't give me any anesthesia because that's going to knock, you know, all of my memory right out of this front lobal part of my brain. And he's like, well, we can't do it. And I'm like, no, really, I'm tough. I can do it. Just do it fast. And don't you just, like, stick something in there and punch it? And he's like, without anesthesia? And I'm like, yeah, just do it because we can't risk me losing all these lines. I just I can't do it. And so it was. I think it was the first time he'd ever done it. And he just punched that little sucker out, and I was fine. And left and went and did my lines and by you know 4 a.m. that boob was the size of a football and I was icing it all night and wishing I had some kind of drug but he didn't find any cancer that day and um, I had a weird feeling for the next year and a half literally and 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 was having a they always say well breast cancer is it painful well yeah it sometimes is mine was and I went back in for the next mammogram and they said there's nothing there and I said well there is and he did the ultrasound. There's nothing there. I said, I insist there is, and did a biopsy, and swore up and down to me that it was, did not look like cancer in a little test tube, and called me two days later and told me that it was. And uh, then I had to go give a motivational speech that evening, <laughs> so I went and did that, and um, and that's how it started. I guess in, in, within a month I was in, in surgery. So well, a very very lucky sounds- person. Oh, yeah, and we could do an hour on that topic alone. But it sounded yeah. like, long story short, that it was just you being persistent and knowing your body. Yes, and I think that's pe- what people need to know. That's what they need to know. Doctors are busy. Um, I think they, that a lot of them live in such a small, enclosed world environment of, you know, complaining patients and sick people and whatnot. And, you know, you have to really know what's going on. And you have to fo- – it's following the gut instinct in life than anything, to be a good actor following instinct, to raise your children, hopefully having a good instinct, and to take care of yourself, good instincts, and follow them. Don't push them down. Follow those instincts. Well, getting into the acting side of things, uh, as far as horror, the horror genre, because you're probably most known from Friday Part 7. Uh, right. When do you really recollect uh, being, uh, becoming a fan of the horror genre itself? Um, well, that, that, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I have never had it phrased exactly like that. That's pretty cool. Thanks. Um, you know, I didn't really know it at all. I was a fan of the series, so I wanted to do the show after we real, after I realized what it was, because it wasn't named Friday 13th, and I wanted to do it, and in shooting it, I, I didn't have, of course, any clue at all. You don't know anything when you're shooting it. And the night of the premiere in Los Angeles, I've always had this thing in life where I wanted to be an actress that could morph and chameleon-like into different looks. And that's what we did in, in the 80s and or in the early 90s. Of course, really now it's more you kind of keep one look and work as that, you know. But at, at, even as a younger actress, I always wanted to have a different look and be different. So uh, the night of the premiere, I had these big brown glasses that I wore, and I thought, well, nobody's gonna, nobody will recognize me because I'm wearing glasses. It, it was the most ridiculous idea I've ever had. And so I went with a bunch of my friends into Westwood and watched the movie and was just having a good old time watching it with everybody else for the first the first time the whole way through. And uh, when we left, somebody turned and said, oh, my God, it's her, it's Tina. And I, it was so strange. My sister looked over and she said, I think you need to run. 
and I was chased down uh, uh, Westwood uh, by a little mob of actually very friendly fans that were excited, but it scared me to death, and I hid behind a car in a parking lot and watched all the feet run by. And um, so I thought, well, well that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, even all these years later, uh, and obviously you didn't jump into the convention scene or anything that, like that till later on, uh, right. how is the fan reaction uh, for you when you're out and about or even at, down in the Texas area to, where you're from? Mm-hmm. It's it's a very interesting um, it's a very interesting thing because I have a really wide group of super fans. I've got I've got the Knox Landing super fans, which are the adults, and then their kids, right? And then and then the even older ones. And then I've got uh, the Knox Landing fans, which is probably my one of my most favorite things ever to do, um, which are. You know, the women that wanted to look like not planning, the gays that wanted to dress like us on not planning, and the guys that wanted to look at the hot girls on not planning. So, <laughs> but, you know, it's just nice. I'm so fan. So that's a neat group. And then I've got the group of um, QVC fans, because I was a co- uh, um, celebrity guest host for 19 years on QVC, which, you know, goes to millions and millions. So I have shopping channel fans. So it's really, it's fun. It's, it's a really weird group and fun group. And I, I guess I would say a mixed, really mixed demographic because I never know what they're knowing me from. But I do tend, my children would say, Mom, just don't look them in the eye. Don't look anybody in the eye. Don't make eye contact. And then, and then they started saying, Mom, just don't talk. Don't, don't let them hear your voice. <laughs> and I'm like, well, well, what the heck can I do, kids? I mean, that's a good life. So it, it's a fun are, mixed group. Yeah, you're a people person, so that, for your kids to say, "Hey, mom, don't talk," it seems really weird, you know. <laughs> it was so bizarre, but you know, they 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 were. I, I raised my kids in probably the most non Hollywood uh, type environment, and kids don't know what their parents are doing. Half the time, you ask kids, "What's your parent doing?" They don't even know. Oh, they go to work. You know, they don't really know. But and my kids, we've always had some kind of a studio around and whatever, and. Um, I, I'll tell you a funny story that happened at a Target that no one has heard, if you want to hear oh, it. Oh, boy. Sure, go okay. for it. Okay, this was a funny one. Um, we had we had just moved back, moved to Texas. My husband had passed away, and I really wanted to raise the kids with the schools here. And so I moved back here to kind of get around family and all that kind of stuff. And we went to a Target. We're just shopping in Target, and we're checking out. And the lady at the, and my kids were younger, so they were like, you know what, maybe 13 and 10, maybe a little younger that. And, uh, we were checking out, and the woman at the checkout, she went, oh my god, it's you! It's Linda Verity from Not Planning, oh my god! And, and I went, oh, no, 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 no. That's my sister. And she went, Oh, it is? And I said, yeah. I mean, if I were her, would I be here? And she goes, oh, that is so funny. And the kids' eyes are looking back and forth at each other. Now, my sister has dark brown hair, dark green eyes. Okay, we're completely different. And uh, my poor sister has been used for all kinds of scapegoating. And uh, give her my credit card, and she's ringing it up. And she turns to me with this sour look on her face, and she says, so, your sister has your same name, Laura Park Lincoln? <laughs> And this just went, oh. <laughs> and the kids were mortified, and I was mortified, and it was pretty funny. Well, speaking of which, because, uh, and that's two different uh, topics in itself, but for, uh, obviously you mentioned it, your husband had passed away, ironically, of uh, yeah. cancer as well. Uh, yeah. How difficult was that for you to be a single working mother and try to keep your focus there? Well, I tell you, it's not as difficult as most women have it because I, I had money and I had advantages and I had resources. So that that alone makes a huge difference. So so people that have all of that need to just basically shut the F up. So um, aside from that, I had a, a dream of a marriage. I was married 14 years to the day to a truly amazing man, truly, really was, and my son is very much like him. The the difficult part was his cancer lasted two years, and he ended up paralyzed with it. So while I was shooting quite a bit, we were putting two, I was putting two two 
what, car seats and a wheelchair into a, a van and a car driving throughout the whole process. That, so it was a physical exhaustion, and we didn't really use nannies. We used them once in a while um, and, and some friends. We, we raised our kids alone, and he had stayed home with Piper until she was five and, and did Mr. Mom and, and thank God because that's where my children got all of their their true generous human nature. I'm sure that's where they got it. But, but, you know, I was talking about this over with a friend of mine last night because she's a single mom trying to get her, her boy to – uh, baseball and whatnot, and, and I said, well, I let them choose two activities. One was scouts and one was something else. They could only do two because I'm not a taxi, and <laughs> um, and I wish more parents would think that way. And uh, and we got, we did it. I mean, it was it was hard. Cooking was hard for me. I'm not, I wasn't a kitchen person. Cooking was hard. Doing the daily stuff was hard. You know, but I was able to hire people to help out when I needed it. I think the emotional part of being alone when I thought I'd have to make forever was extremely hard for me and still is today. I mean, I don't, I don't think it goes away. It, does, it doesn't get better with time. It just goes into a different kind of emotion that you can deal with easier. Really, that, that's what I think it does. And, you know, my boy, um, I did Girl Scouts and Den, Den Mom and my boy ended up as an Eagle Scout and, um, you know, it worked out. But, also, I think for single mothers and single parents, there's a lot of single fathers now, too, a lot of them, and raising their kids completely alone. And uh, I think the key is really deciding the discipline in your home and following it with consistency and, uh, and raising those children young, you know, raising them, raising them young the right way. And I know this will sound crazy, but my children never had a TV or a computer or a video game in their room ever until they went to college. Okay. Well, let me ask you this then as far as the kids, because obviously now they're older. Your daughter, and I'm not trying to make you sound, Laura is still unbelievable, only 33 years old. I was 19 for 10 years. (laughs) Yeah. So... You know, her daughter has graduated college and doing well. Her son's now in college. If your hus- if you could speak to your husband for, and this might sound weird, I don't want to sound bad with it, but if your hu- you could talk to your husband, Michael, now, do you think he'd be proud of how the kids have turned out? I think he he is just having the time of his life watching these amazing kids. I'm I'm really really lucky with it. Um, it, it I'm. You know, and, and, it, and of course it's not just luck, but because I didn't know how to raise kids, I, I would kill them a million times over for me waiting to age 30 to have them married 10 years and then he died. I mean, that was a very cruel joke, but um, <laughs> that was because, because he was so wonderful with the kids. But, you know, I I was really, I was I used army brat sensibility and some common sense to help me raise them, and... I tell you, he's probably more proud and wondering what the heck happened to me. You know, the house, you, I used to be perfect. The house was perfect. Everything was perfect. He's like, what the heck happened to Larvitt? Dang, those kids are great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the kids turned out all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they did. They, they, they turned out really, really awesome. But, uh, you know, and you speak of which, you know, the house, the working, and just how busy you stay uh, yeah. constantly. Is uh, would you say trying to stay busy in any or all aspects of your life uh, almost like an Achilles heel for you? Well, I popped my Achilles heel training for a marathon, so I don't know about that analogy, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that wasn't fun. That was a wheelchair for a year and a half. Um, <laughs> I I think busy. It, it may be the wrong word. I think you have to stay passionate about something. And you have to uh, – I'm not really as busy as I used to be and that I've chosen not – well, I've had health issues, but I've also chosen not to be. And another thing, too, is you have to have goals in your life. And I don't, I don't care what your business is or what your life is. You have to have some goals that you want to achieve. And then you have to have some passion in doing them, even if you work a really crummy job because that's what you have to do right now to get through – you have to find something else that can bring you some passion so that so that you want to get, get through your days and enjoy them. And I, I find something that's been harder for me is that when you've reached your goals, people don't talk about what you do after you've reached them. When you've really reached them, what do you do next? And um, 
I know the Bruce Jenner interview was recent, and he was saying, you know, when he got the gold medal, his thought was, well, now what do I do? Because when you've trained and you've reached them, it gives you a different perspective. So I would say you have to continually, I know I do, continually find something that keeps my interest, to keep me moving forward, definitely. Everybody needs to do that. Don't stop. Don't, well, not don't stop and be busy, but don't, don't stop creating and moving and thinking forward. And, you know, that seems like it's the most interesting thing about uh, your field in acting, that you can always be creative or go in a different direction or, you know, there's a lot more opportunity to expand and not just go one direction. Well, there, there absolutely can be and there is. There is. But but I, th- I really believe that that's in a lot of fields. I, I really do. I, I even worked in uh, Alzheimer's and um, Alzheimer's uh, – locked memory ward unit for a year and a half through the end of my cancer because I was just so bored with thinking of myself. So what, what started as a as a little different kind of activities program for me grew into a whole other interesting part of life and where I was able to expand their memory program and, and create with that, just doing, you know, a few part-time hours a week. And um, if you've just got to, in whatever job you are, Whatever job you're doing, if it's corporate and stifling or if it's ringing up people at a, at a fast food place or whatever, try to bring something to that job or to those people during that day and that time that elevates your own creativity and, and sense of well-being. That, that's the key because just turning into robots and, and doing jobs is no way to live. It's just no way to that's live. That's true. Even, yeah, even in... You know, even, you know, they always say if you're going to make a sandwich, make the best sandwich. And it sounds so trivial, but it's true. You can just do what you do and realize that whatever your job is, it's working to help somebody else in some way. You're either selling or you're doing secretarial or you're driving or you're doing something. Your you're part of the world is more than you sitting at a desk typing or doing something you may think doesn't matter because if, if the job weren't there, then it wouldn't matter. But the job is there because you matter and the job matters. And just try to put it in that perspective and realize that if it's not the job you want now, it doesn't have to be the job you have forever because hope is the biggest thing people have, the hope of something else and something more. That is definitely true. You A couple of years ago, you were actually quoted for an online interview for iconsoffright.com. So, oh, yeah. yeah, you guys can uh, – a horror website that you uh, spoke with. And, yes, guys, at Icons of uh, Fright, feel free to send that check, check for the, pl- uh, for the uh, plug. That's for sure. Uh, you were quoted <laughs> saying, yeah, they can send money. I, I won't say no to it. Uh, <laughs> well, you were quoted saying, uh, talking about stunts and stuff, that the fire stunt really didn't scare you, but you were giving credit to stunt people who do it full time but you wouldn't oh. recommend falling on a pier. <laughs> no, no, I, I sure wouldn't. If I known my boobs were going to get amputated, I sure wouldn't have treated them so badly if I fall on a pier a million times. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, falling through the, the ceiling in Friday the 13th was probably my favorite stunt because it got to fall, and it was very short. I mean, you know, it looks dramatic, but it, it wasn't that fall of a fall, far of a fall, and, Kane Hodder, of course, who played Jason, is the stunt director. Um, the the fire scene was 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 um, scary, whereas the, the fall through the ceiling was fun. The fire scene was scary because you can't really fake fire, and we were covered in fire retardant, and that was weird. But the the pier scene was particularly uncomfortable because it was a very long pier. I mean, that was a really long pier, and you had to run out and then do a sliding flat front fall on it, and and that wasn't so bad, but it was really cold, and what I've learned when you shoot in very, very cold weather is <laughs> everything hurts really a lot more. Even when I shot in Yugoslavia, you hit your hand on something, you swear it is broken because the cold makes it hurt more, and I miss, um, I misunderstood and miscalculated the number of times I'd have to do that, <laughs> so yes, stunt people... Keep your jobs. You are not in fear of large taking them because I'm clumsy and it's not for me. So y'all just go fall and jump off things and kick things because I do it on a regular basis and break bones and if they need to keep their union strong. 
Yeah, because, you know, it's funny because people will go, oh, well, he just wanted to uh, talk about her boobs some more for the, with a peer and this and that. Oh. They didn't give you, a, like, a chest pad or anything like or was that a limited budget film? Like, to protect yourself, you know, some sort of uh, a I don't, patty. No, I, I, I'm pretty sure there was nothing on me. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure there was nothing on me. But, I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't a fall a stunt person would hurt themselves then. You know, it was me doing it over and over. And when you get into the moment of adrenaline, you know, you don't feel anything at the time. You feel it later. But, <laughs> yeah, but later when you, like, because those she, scenes were shot at night, but in the morning, when you go back to your hotel room and all, you're probably going, yeah. oh, once the adrenaline's wore off, going, oh, man, maybe, yeah. you know, did I do something? It kinda... <laughs> yeah, but... no, it, you know, when, when, when you're shooting, you know, you're going to hurt. You're just going to hurt. I mean, pretty much anything you do, and one of the things I teach my students is that when they do a photo shoot and they're shooting scenes, if they're not hurting by the time they get home in some way, they probably didn't do it right because the human body is not made to look as good as it looks in pictures and on camera, that exaggerated perfect posture and the, the twists and the turns that give you those dramatic, beautiful headshots and things. Bodies don't contort like that. So, you know, it's usually the lower back and things are aching. I'm like, are you hurting yet? And they're like, oh, yes, Miss Laura. I'm like, well, we're going to do it a few more hours then because you're just about there. <laughs> you know, hide the pain and make it look good. <laughs> well, I want to wrap this up with two fan questions that I thought were interesting coming in. Uh, the first one was, there's been rumors for years saying that you, in particular, had written a script or tried to put together a story as te with Tina as a full-grown adult. Uh, yes. Was the project ever pitched, or what? what's the story on that? Well, God, this is, this is just such a fun question, so much fun for me to, to get to have somebody who wants to talk about it. Um, I had written two different Friday the 13th. Uh, after Part 7, I was offered Part 8, and uh, as usual, you know, they didn't have a script, and they weren't going to tell me what was going to happen, and I didn't want Tina to die off in the beginning. I thought her character was really too strong, and my agents didn't, you know, it just wasn't going to work. It was silliness. And so uh, my husband and I wrote a script that was really good, and it just kind of continued the idea of Friday the 13th, and I did pitch that, actually, to Paramount, and they went with their version of Friday Part 8. We know what that turned into be. And so um, years later, I started thinking about the series, and I realized, you know, the fans of the series have aged, but there's a whole new demographic of people that, that still like the idea and want to, want to see different things. So I, uh, I wrote a script where I had Tina grow up and um, become a psychiatrist. And uh, she's a, you know, professional psychiatrist living her life, a little little bitter. She's not the happiest person in the world. And she does marry the character that Kevin played, Nick, in the film. And they divorce, of course. And they are raising their daughter together. And uh, Tina's daughter uh, has the same powers as the mother. But she uses them very, um, in, in a negative way. She's a very troubled teen, which I didn't have, so it was fun to write that. And... Uh, and then in the end, you know, the two end up coming together uh, to fight Jason at the same, same time, coming together. So it was, it was really pretty cool. But nothing came of it uh, at that time. Uh, John Beekler and I have talked about it, the director, a couple of times of expanding Tina's role. But I think it all comes down to the studios and who owns what and what you can do and, you know, just, just the, life. The business anyway. side of things. Pardon me? The business side of things. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it probably has to do with all of that. I mean, it, you know, and I haven't, I haven't made a huge effort to go past just a few people with it, but it's certainly uh, still something I would like to do because I, I think I've, I've written it really strong. If we got a really good horror writer into it, I think they could really tighten it, and, and we'd have quite an amazing story. It would bring in the the older fans that love it, and it would bring in the the newer, younger fans that would love, you know, the hot young. Um, Tina's daughter, so yeah, it's there. It's uh, just not happening well, right now. <laughs> well, let me throw this one in there as well, because uh, I know or at least heard that your daughter acted a little bit. Would you be open to your daughter doing that role if something were to happen with the script? To kind of have yeah. a mother daughter, both in real life and in film, oh, do something. Yeah, it'd be really cool. Uh, she she 
she's actually, uh, you know, she's she's acted quite a bit. She's acting quite a bit in France now, in Paris. Uh, even though her job is in science, she studied science and French and biology. You know, what a waste of a beautiful head. You know, to study that, I always told her, but she teases me. I'm like, I do all this work and get you the Texas crown, and you become a biologist scientist. But she's the best looking one there is. But um, you know, I think that that would be super amazing. I, I don't know if it would be her her interest or really if uh, uh, if she would look enough like me. Our faces are similar, but our skin coloring is completely opposite. She's dark, dark hair, dark, dark eyes, and more of an olive skin. It was <laughs> she was really surprising when she popped out like that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think the teen uh, right now, my daughter could absolutely play a teen, but I think the teen in the show would have to be probably at about uh, seventeen. For, for the defiant stuff to work, but I, I'd probably stick her in there somewhere. <laughs> okay. Well, the next question I... <laughs> What's that? Nepotism. i got to throw the boy in there somewhere, too, and he does not like the camera. <laughs> nice. Uh, the last question I want to throw out there, which I just learned about last night and heard, there's rumblings that you got another book coming out at, towards the end of 2015 here. Uh, what's the status yes. of that? I actually have three, <laughs> three, hmm. and I'm. Yeah, I don't know which one's going to get out first. I have, um, I have another acting book uh, that I've written that's never been written about how to train actors called Slate. Never been written before, and it's critical to actors learning how to actually get jobs. Uh, the, another one close to my heart is called The Yes Jar, Raising Responsibility. That's children. the one I heard about. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, I actually still have a little olive jar that I created a yes jar out of, uh, and it was because I felt in a world of no, we needed more yeses. As a mother, I just found myself saying no, and I knew that needed to change. But it's really saying no with um, with a lot of constraints. And uh, and then the one I'm close to my heart uh, it's called Lucky Girl. And it's it's not about breast cancer, but each chapter is something really complicated, wild, crazy, and bizarre that I've lived through and tried to do with perspective and humor. And, uh, you know, many people live through so many crazy things, but I've kind of lived through all of them at once. So it, it's, a, it's kind of a review of everything from, you know, stalkers shooting me to being robbed or mugged in New York to illness to moves to, you know, just all of the things that happen. And it's called Lucky Girl because I am one lucky girl. So those are the ones I hope to have out um, pretty shortly. Yeah. Well, if fans want to reach out to see what Laura Park Lincoln is up to or reach out to say hello or any of that stuff, what's the best way they can find you? Uh, LauraParkLincoln.com. Yeah. And I'm guessing you have links for your social media and any of that stuff that you want them to have out there, right? Yeah, probably. The uh, Lar Park Lincoln uh, Facebook is, is maxed out, so I'm asking fans if they go to the official Lar Park Lincoln fan page. That would help a lot. And uh, the studio page is Actors Audition Studios with Lar Park Lincoln. And I would love for people to go like that and uh, see what the actors are up to. You know, I've got some people on some pretty big shows right now. I'm pretty proud of them. And... Uh, and then the book out right now is Get Started, Not Scammed. And so, yeah, there's links and stuff. I'm not too hard to find. They can find information, and and uh, hopefully it will help inform and entertain them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know you want to cuddle up with your poodles, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. I've enjoyed it tremendously. I hope your fans enjoy your show and uh, and that you have a super rest of this day. And well, that's because I usually pay the fans to like it, but yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> well, just just remember, you know, we all have a choice to make this day good, and I'm going to pour a nice tea and finish getting started with it and make it happen. These days, there's no shortage of people ready to tell you what to do. I'm not one of those people, because I'm here to talk about Yingling Lager from America's oldest brewery, a company that was told what to do several times over and generally ignored the advice. I could say that that's a reason to drink it, but that's your call. Some folks like beer that stands for something. Others like beer that tastes like something. If you're looking for taste, look for the rich amber color of Yingling Lager. It's a sign of a well-crafted, distinctly satisfying lager. If you want a beer that stands for something, consider the beer that stood for something since 1829. 
For six generations, Yingling has chosen brewing right over brewing big. Every time. Yingling just stands for beer. Says something about Yingling Lager and the people who drink it. I won't tell you what to drink, but think about it. We've survived for 185 years because we make darn good beer. Yingling, American-owned, family-operated. D.G. Yingling & Son, Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Please enjoy responsibly. Do you enjoy murder, madness, and mayhem? Then find it with the King of Horror, Andy G, and the Mad Cat Guru Geek Keith on Talking Terror Presents on blogtalkradio.com and iTunes. Talking Terror Presents, where no film is too good or too bad. Stay scared. Oh, I'll see you in hell. Tell him where to send you. 